here is another talking to myself session. I want to wrap up this fusion story and I thought a little bit also about relative cohomology and it seems that the framework is a very powerful setup also to deal with relative cohomology. It's just a matter of definition. What we can do is we can just define relative cohomology. We have a closed simplicial complex in another simplicial complex, and this is a subsimplicial complex. We can just define the cohomology as the cohomology of U of the complement. And then also we can do the dual thing. If you have an open set, we can also have the relative cohomology uh, identified as with HK. So the reason why we want to do that is then we have the excision property, which is uh, part of this Eilenberg steamroad axiom system is obvious. I mean, it's just part of the definition. You don't have to prove anything. It's also intuitively clear what happens when you are taking a closed sub complex and you identify that you kind of put it together. The U is obtained by just taking the K and pulling it together. So you can think about this G over K, modulo K, all the points in K, all the simplices in K are identified, you know, collapse to one point. And you can think about this uh, as the, you know, then you compactify that, that additional point. So this is a one point compactification of the open set. So this allows you to compute the cohomology of these uh, quotients. And it's very nice to have this property of being able to take quotients because then you are in a much larger framework. You have just to uh, also adapt the topology every time you make such an identification, you adapt the topology. And then we are actually in a much more general framework. I think we are actually in the most general framework, which is interesting, like delta sets. Delta sets are the most abstract objects we want to cover because it contains simplicial sets, it contains uh, it contains uh, CW complexes, you can then of course simplicial complexes and of course simplicial complexes coming from graphs. And uh, I also think, uh, I'm not sure whether this is true, that all these objects we can actually also always, if you look at pairs, we can uh, restrict to uh, graphs and we don't lose any any uh, uh, generality but this has to be investigated still so uh, what I just wanted to do is illustrate this story with a couple of examples very simple examples just showing that here we have a kind of one of the simplest simplicity complexes which you can imagine it's the Wheatley complex of a graph of a C5 graph and so it's a one-dimensional complex and we take just as k, we take the five vertices. And then if we identify these five vertices, uh, we get this uh, bouquet of circles. And uh, But how we think about this is just if we take them away, we get an open set. And this open set consists of five maximal simplices, which are these uh, five edges. And now the computation of the cohomology is very simple. I mean, what you can do is, I mean, here in this case, the cohomology is uh, it's a circle here. It's just five points, so it's five zero. Here it is zero five because each of these simplices has zero one. So we have this added additivity property of Eilenberg uh, steamroll. And then we have also the, uh, if you look at the quotient, if you look at the quotient, then this is the open set compactified compactified meanings that we have this additional point that is plays the role of k. Everything in k has been put together to one point. And we get now a quiver, a bouquet of circles, and this is definitely no more a simplicity complex. It's normal. So that has bothered us quite a bit more than 10 years ago when we worked on uh, Riemann Hurwitz. So Riemann Hurwitz is in this framework very, very simple. And then come maybe back to this at another time. Riemann Horowitz deals with the situation you have a complex and you have a group act action, and then you are interested in the Euler characteristic of the quotient. And then it depends on the ramification points. So you have a ramification indices which you add up, and then you have, in the most simple case, it's just 
the, the euler characteristic of the complex divided by the, the group order. That's the euler characteristic of the quotient if there is no ramification point. But we will see that that's kind of very interesting in mathematics. This branch covers is very important. So the framework is actually quite convenient. And I like the framework because it is a simple data structure. If you look at the book of uh, Eilenberg Steenroll, you know, they did that work in 1945 and in 1952 they wrote the whole book. It's full of cognitive diagrams, diagram chasing. And this is, if you do that with a computer, theoretically, not numerically, but theoretically you want to deal with this. Maybe, you know, what the, you want to prove things in Lean, you don't want commutative diagrams, it's just not good. So this is kind of very convenient and that you have seen, I mean, you have seen the, the computation of the cohomology of U and so the cohomology of G over K is five lines of code. So that was the first example. The second example is you can also do something like edge collapse. And so in this case, I'm making, so if you take K is equal, if I take K just one edge with the boundary, of course you take closed sets, then this is just an edge collapse. You can do that in much more general situations. But here I took as k, I took a relatively large part and I took it so large that if you take the quotient, then you're also no more getting a simplicity complex. Here you get the multigraph, you have multiple connections. So what is very nice in this framework, we have a, then also the arithmetic and everything that all the theorems you know in mathematics like poincare hopf uh, Euler Poincare, uh, Dalles Bonne, or whatever you are uh, looking at, they are kind of, they generalize immediately to this much more general uh, framework. But this is an interesting example. It's kind of a, an example where you take a, a sphere and you choke the middle part, like this octopus, and choke this middle part into two. So what I get is then, and if it's the quotient, I get two spheres, a bouquet of, sp bouquet of two spheres. So in this case, we have a K is the circle, so we have a, and then the, the complement, the open set, is just consists of two open balls. And of course, the, the Betty vector homology is zero, zero, two. There are two volume forms and nothing else. And then uh, if you take the, if you compactify that, if you take just uh, one point compactification, we get this book of speed. And the computation is kind of, we have the BK, we have the BU, that's the only thing we need. And then we just add one. This is actually the reduced cohomology of that object. This is always the open set, it's just the reduced cohomology. So that's, uh, and then uh, here is an example where we take two, choke away two, we take away kind of, a, of a donut, we take away two, we take a donut and uh, are taking two rings, two rings, uh, two circles away. And what the complement is then just are two open cylinders. And uh, this has zero two two. This has uh, two two zero. It's the two circles, and then we can uh, we can just add them up. So these are two kissing croissants coming together here at one point. And the common so there are two volume forms. There's two, also two uh, loops which you can form, and then there is one connected component. In general, he would take k equal to g, then the u is empty. So in that axiom system, you want a contractible set has, you know, trivial cohomology and the zero empty set has the zero uh, cohomology. And this means uh, homotopy. Homotopy is also very nicely understood in this framework, right? What we do is, in order to make a homotopy deformation, we take you take an open set here, uh, which has the property that its closure is com contractible and also generally you want just the boundary. You want the boundary to be contractible and you want the closure to be contractible. And then you can take it away without changing anything. The last thing, I once got this octopus, of course it has eight legs. So I ask myself, so what happens if I take here as the set k, I take these eight circles. I take eight circles here. So what happens is I take the octopus and I choke away each of the legs. So I, the whole octopus is a sphere, so it's one, zero, one, that's the g. And then the k, what happens is they are eight circles. So this is eight, eight, zero, so that's like here. 
and then uh, we look at the U. So the U consists now of eight balls, which is, uh, if you have eight balls, it's zero, zero, 008. But then there is also a component which is left, which is actually just a sphere with eight holes. So it has zero, seven, nine, and then the cohomology of that uh, sphere with eight spheres attached. Yeah, it's not a bouquet of spheres because they are not attached at the same point. That has then the cohomology 179. And so you could compute that also with other you know, tools like uh, myometries or whatever. But in this case, it's very, very you know, down to earth. Again, this computation, for example, all these computations, these are just kernels, dimension of kernels of finite matrices. Okay, that's it for today.